It's Sunday, March 31, 2024. I'm Anthony Davis. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we make the time to consider the news of the week. You can support my work and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Our guest today is the founder and publisher of Courier, a pro-democracy digital news network with newsrooms in 10 states. Tara McGowan, welcome back to The Weekend Show. Thanks, Anthony. Happy to be back. So uh, you and I, we, we kind of have similar roles in as much as we were so frustrated with what the way the news was running in the US and cable news and all the craziness that we decided to kind of set up our own little news networks. And, uh, and I'm thrilled that yours is just gr- growing at, at such a, an amazing rate in Korea and doing such good work as well. Um, Let's turn our attention at the beginning of this conversation to, to NBC, which uh, <laughs> probably did something that neither you or I would do, and that is to hire the former chair of the Republican National Committee, Rona McDaniel. Um, she's since been fired, uh, so that story come, came and went. But there's something quite symbolistic about that, isn't it? Uh, you know, the idea that somebody who's been telling lies for Donald Trump for the last few years you know, gets the job as a as a talking head on a, on a mainstream news network. Uh, she was fired after a revolt from on screen newscasters. H- how did you feel when you heard that she'd been given that job? Uh, I wish that I could say that I was surprised. Um, I wasn't very surprised. This isn't the first time uh, we've seen a major uh, cable news network or news network in America platform. Um, uh, Someone who has unabashedly lied and propagated lies and disinformation. And as I was, I was very delighted and also surprised a little bit to hear, um, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the NBC hosts actually come out and call her a gaslighter because they had been gaslit by her. So I unfortunately wasn't surprised that NBC made the decision. We've seen this before um, with a lot of mainstream and legacy news organizations platforming these folks, you know, in exchange for things like access and, and being able to claim objectivity and claiming that they're representing both sides. But I I think what we saw with uh, everybody coming out so quickly and fiercely against the decision within their own ranks, within the network itself, um, was really this attack on their own credibility, right? Uh, Folks like uh, Rachel Maddow um, and Joy Behar, they took this like very, very personally, right? Where it's like, how can you um, put somebody on this network and legitimize them uh, with this job and this platform when they have lied directly to our face and propagated lies? And uh, Rana Romney McDaniel is, uh, you know, somebody who was one of the biggest perpetrators of the big lie and and ones who advanced that on behalf of Trump after the election. So uh, for her to have been given that job is is insane. Um, it was it was a very preventable mistake. I think it's, uh, you know, we see this all the time, too. But truly, these networks and the people that lead them seem wildly out of touch for them to not have predicted the backlash from their own anchors and their own staff which obviously they heard and thus acted upon by canceling her contract just a few short days later. That's just the thing that's most baffling to me is just how unbelievably out of touch they are to think that this is normal and then that they could normalize it. So I hope that there are lessons learned uh, from, from, from the backlash and, and their response to it. The the one interview that she did do with the network, which she actually did a, a week or so before, she, it was announced that she had this job was she was asked the question, you know, if Joe Biden won and Donald Trump lost and she admitted that Joe Biden was the president, but she still refused to say that Donald Trump had lost the election. This is despite Donald Trump kicking her out of the RNC and replacing her with, with, with Lara Trump as co-chair and the redirection of funds now. So if you donate to the RNC, the money is now going to Trump's pack which then pays his legal bills before it even gets to you know, paying to show candidates, support candidates. I mean, it's almost as if he has a hold over her and everybody in the Republican Party to the point that even after losing that job, she still can't say that he lost. No, she can. And she's not willing to because... 
um, that's the currency she has, right? And that's the currency that landed her that job before she was fired, before she could really do very much with it, um, is, is the access that she, she has and had and the role, the very prominent role she played um, uh, in defending Trump in the last administration and the aftermath of that. And so uh, without that, if she doesn't want to come to the good side, the side of the truth and the side of, you know, uh, where a lot of Republicans and a lot of former Trump uh, administration officials have frankly come, which is being honest with themselves and with the public about what they saw and 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 the culpable role they played and how they wanted to not be a part of that any longer. We're not seeing that from Rana. She would rather capitalize on this. Um, what she does next, you know, we don't know being, you know, uh, fired um, so publicly. I'm sure she's humiliated uh, by it. I think she's she's threatening legal action against NBC. She can continue to dig her heels in to try to stay relevant because her, you know, former boss is uh, the nominee on the Republican ticket uh, for president. Or she could, you know, come to the light side and try to capitalize on that, as some others have done. Her salary would have been three hundred thousand dollars a year for two years. So, as you say, she's she's probably going to sue for the six hundred thousand. She has herself some, uh, you know, management already who did that deal and are probably going to, you know, push to to for her to get full payment because she didn't renege on her contract, did she? I mean, so again, it's frustrating that it seems to be like yet another Republican propaganda machine that is being rewarded with a big cash prize. Yeah, I mean, look, I think she'll probably sue for a lot more in damages and defamation yeah. beyond just what they are for the contract. And we don't know the details of the contract. I mean, you know, I, it's th that is a significant sum of money in the scheme of things. But, it, it, you know, it wasn't a seven figure contract, at least. And they didn't you know, I, I'm not aware that they actually plan to pay her out either way. So I understand why she's suing. I mean, this is why I call this preventable. Right. Like I, I have I have no very little sympathy for Ron. I don't know her personally at all. I think that, um, you know, being a perpetrator of the big lie and everything that the last administration did and that Trump stands for um, is is massively dangerous and harmful to our democracy and our country, regardless of what party you're from. Um, that said, you know, she should never have been hired to begin with. And this could have been prevented. And so this is, is cost the NBC and hopefully it costs their credibility and it should. Do you think, though, that they're going down the same route as, you know, we heard from, was it the boss of uh, ABC, you know, when they talked about the fact that Trump was box office and that, you know, this is a great way to drive ratings and he's having the former chair of the RNC, someone to, you know, put the cat amongst the pigeons, as we as we say, to actually create a drama so that they can turn that into advertising revenue. I mean, surely that's why they hired her. Oh, absolutely. And just their, um, their really out of touch understanding of, of relevance and import as a news organization yeah. in this country today. I mean, I think, uh, it, we saw this with CNN too, right? Where, you know, they brought on, uh, Chris from the Colbert show to take over after, um, Jeff Zucker was, was pushed out and, uh, with an entire strategy around trying to make it more balanced again, um, by suggesting that under the end of Zucker's tenure during the Trump administration, CNN had become more, uh, liberal or, you know, more anti Republican in their reporting when frankly what they were was more aggressively pro-democratic and more pro-truth. And so this clinging by really the dinosaurs that still run major news organizations um, uh, and outlets in this country to this idea that objectivity and balance um, is takes precedence over um, upholding truth and holding liars um, and lies accountable very aggressively, um, their desire to put the interest of maintaining sources with these liars and the propagators of lies over actually holding them accountable. We see this over and over again. And, and it's, um, it, in my opinion, it's an incredible lack of courage and lack of integrity. Uh, by executives of these news organizations in a 
crisis moment for our democracy. And, you know, without a democracy, there's no free press in this country. So I'm really un confused about their not understanding the direct connection to their own job security uh, and the ability to maintain relevance and audience and to do the job that they purport to do, which is to inform the public. And so uh, these misguided decisions by their business executives, by uh, their leadership, yes, it is to your point because they believe that they need to have representation of all these voices and they need to have people who can add new uh, topics and frankly lies and salacious comments to their programming um, during this election season. Uh, and Trump was a huge boon to their uh, to their revenue um, in past years. And I, I think there 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 is just a crisis over how to cover Trump today. There has been an enormous amount of criticism for how they covered him and monetized and benefited from that coverage um, in the lead up to uh, the 2016 election and during his administration. And so we've seen some step back. We've seen some try to wade back into these waters. They don't really know what to do, um, but they do know that they have to keep attention uh, and engagement to stay in business. And so I think that they're all flailing at trying to understand how to do that while while maintaining true values and ethics of journalism, which I just don't I don't think that they're choosing the right ones in this moment to adhere to. Are, are ethics in journalism compatible with rampant profiteering in the media? Because maybe this is the issue. The news should not be for profit in the same way that healthcare should not really be for profit either. We've seen what happens when, when they are. And record profits is the other thing, isn't it? Because, you know, fine, make a little profit, you know, be able to pay all your staff. But a lot of these media companies, because they are, are now swallowing up smaller organizations and have become so big that there is a, a pressure from shareholders to make record profits and to, and to keep paying those dividends. How much of that is a, is a problem in, in U.S. news? I'm, I mean, I'm certain it's a very large problem. I mean, I, I don't want to get too into the weeds on this because I study the media industry and sort of the, the really, uh, a disastrous state that it's in um, here and abroad. Uh, but, you know, when you say record profits, record profits today for these news networks are not what they used to be. They're never right. going to be what they used to be um, because the, the media ecosystem has shifted so dramatically. Right. So like on on a great night, uh, cable news networks are getting, you know, between one and three million viewers. Right. In a in a country uh, that uh, has 100 X that. So it's I, I think that they are all trying to figure out ways to stay relevant right now. Like that's what I believe that it is. It is, it, they, they hear the death knell um, for this old model of broadcast journalism and traditional broadcasting cable news and punditry. And it's all moved online, right? There's, far more audience share on programs that are, are based entirely on audiences on YouTube and TikTok and Instagram Reels. And so I, I think that they are just trying to stay relevant to the elite audiences that they still serve. And, and they are still trying to cling to this idea that they can have it both ways, that they can represent both sides and try to keep this false narrative about a two-party system and a two-party government in this country where one party has abandoned uh, an adherence to our democratic values and institutions, and they don't know what to do. They don't know how to handle this. And so all that they can do with their limited imaginations and strategic ideas about uh, how to evolve reporting and news uh, distribution and consumption today um, is to find uh, the most uh, salacious and attention grabbing uh, voices and headlines and topics to be able to drive their programming. And I think it's a really pathetic and sad state. And I do think that it is us watching the end of this type of news format that never served us very well. And putting 12 people on the screen at once does not suit me. Certainly it's something I, I can't bear. If you watch multiple hours of cable news, which a lot of, like, you know, there are people on both sides of the spectrum that do, whether it's MSNBC uh, or CNN or, or Fox, it will rot your brain. Yeah. I truly yeah. feel like I, I have friends who work in these organizations. I'm not, I'm not diminishing them. This is the model that they are in right now. They have to get out of it, but it truly, it will make you dumber. 
um, because you're just hearing the same thing said over and over again by uh, a few similar voices. And uh, it's just redundant. It doesn't bring new voices or ideas to the table. It doesn't push audiences to think differently, constructively, or or outside of the prism of um, a very reduced idea of our politics and government. And it, it doesn't serve us in a moment where we are facing a truly authoritarian leader uh, taking and seizing power and maintaining it, which is is the risk that we're up against. So let's talk about that. The, the election coverage from the major networks Currently, they have a template which they've used for every election going back decades. They like, they treat each candidate relatively equally. They both sides every story. And there's no space made for the fact that one of the candidates in Donald Trump is very mentally, emotionally compromised, probably compromised from a national security perspective as well. He is, he is absolutely not the type of person that you want running. And that's not me saying it because I'm a snowflake and I don't want him to win. That's me saying it because the the very republic is at stake, knowing that if he was to be successful this time, then the the whole world would, would certainly look very different. And, you know, I've been reporting on how European leaders are scrambling to try and bolster their their military and their strategy for future um uh, war because they consider that that Donald Trump would pull the US out of NATO and wouldn't support other nations. I mean that is pretty terrifying, isn't it? So so what could the major networks be doing to change their strategy for how they cover this and not do the old two horse race presentation that they obviously have planned? I, I think it's incredibly simple. You focus on the stakes of this race, not the horse race itself, right? right? Um, there is so much material um, to be unearthed and exposed and explained and reinforced to the American public that is in writing and verbalized in their own words from their own uh, their own uh, mouths about what both candidates running for president will do um, if elected, what their vision for this country is, what their position is, what they will want to advance when it comes to either protecting and advancing or uh, retreating and banning rights on our bodies and our bodily autonomy and our reproductive freedom, um, when it comes to handling the immigration crisis, when it comes to uh, you know uh, addressing the climate crisis and advancing a clean energy um, economy and, and revolution that would actually be able to conserve our environment and also build economic power that is sustainable in this country. So there's so much at stake in the world and in this country right now. And the two uh, individuals that are running uh, for president in 2024 could not represent more polar opposite ideals, values, or positions on how to solve the biggest problems in front of us. And so there is no shortage of information that needs to be reported in order to inform people about what this country will look like under a second Biden administration and term or a second Trump administration and term. And for your folks watching and listening, if if you haven't explored and dove in or watched the explainers on Project 2025, which is the plan put forward by the Heritage Foundation by former Trump administration officials for the plan that Trump would enact if elected president, then they really should, because it's absolutely horrifying. Um, they are not sugarcoating anything that they would do when it comes to uh, banning and criminalizing abortion in this country, uh, uh, banning contraception, IVF, as we saw in Alabama. That is that is not a fluke. That is very much core to their strategy. Uh, what they would do in terms of internment camps, <laughs> essentially, for migrants of this country, um, the way that they want to roll back uh, policies and progress relating to voting rights and health and human rights in this country. So um, none of it is is a hidden agenda. It is all out there for the taking. And every day that journalists in this country are not thinking of ways to, to make this really terrifying information and these plans more digestible and to put these in front of the American people
people so they really know what these candidates are running on and what they stand for um, is malpractice. And uh, and it could hand um, it could hand away our democracy, essentially, if that information isn't getting to people, because everyone feels that they know Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Right. We we've had this this contest before. Um, and this is the third presidential election in a row that Donald Trump is running for president. So um, he is not a new figure to your point, though. Uh, he is not nearly as coherent as he yeah. maybe was, if we could call him coherent a few years ago. Um, people really should listen to a speech of his uninterrupted and and ask themselves who of the two candidates sounds like they have dementia more, um, because it's very evident that Donald Trump would win that um, race. And so it, it, I just think that that's the media has a responsibility um, to use the information that is available to them to report that information and to explain it to the public rather than focus on the things that drive the most clicks or engagement or that, frankly, they've just known used to drive the most clicks and engagement. So, you know, the, all media companies um, and newsrooms are strapped. They have less capacity and less resources than ever before. That is also dangerous to our democracy, um, but they can't be lazy. And they can't rest on the laurels of what drove them ratings beforehand when they have a real responsibility and a job to play in protecting and preserving democracy. Let people make their own informed decisions by putting the facts in front of them, but make sure that the choices you're making about what you cover and how you cover it and how often you cover it are about the information that matters most to people when they're making decisions about who to vote for or whether or not um, it is worth their time and energy to vote. I suppose a good example of this is that if you read the Project 2025 document, which is around 900 pages, and it, you know you can anyone can do download it, it it talks, as you say, about abortion and about you know all of these rights that would be taken away, as well as the eradication of any mention of climate change. But that's a that's another conversation. And yet, if you were to watch Donald Trump recently, because he's obviously been getting feedback and done polling on the the abortion debate, he rec he's now starting to change the story a little bit. Oh, well, you know, I would consider 15 weeks and I'm thinking about this and thinking about that. And we will have to see. We'll have to see. But actually, that's not what the manifesto says. And so the media obviously goes with Donald Trump because he's saying that in the moment, but he's saying it because he's reacting and he's a populist but actually the facts of what they're going to do are in black and white and that's what the media should be focusing on because a lot of this is not down to trump no oh, that's uh exactly right and i think that uh that's where it's important that people also know right presidents don't just run government yeah. their administrations do um, and 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 I think that's another whole area that that reporters could be focused on about who are the individuals um, that are going to be part of that administration and what are they also saying and putting forward uh, because it, it 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 is all out there and it is quite scary. Um, also, you know, this is the first president ever in our history to have this many counts against them to be in this much debt from having lost. Uh, cases regarding sexual assault and defamation of the woman that he abused. Um, he is going to sit in court in, you know, a little over two weeks time uh, for a number of months this year uh, to face charges of um, uh, felony charges of having used um, campaign money to silence um, uh, a woman, Stormy Daniels, uh, from speaking about how uh, he had sexual relations with her. So like this is, I mean, it, it is unprecedented times. It sounds like it's a joke. It's not. This is also the same man who is hawking Bibles to evangelical voters on his website to make money, to your earlier point, to push into his super PAC to pay his lawyers to defend him against um, bribery charges, essentially, um, in a federal court. So, you know, there is... Um, this is not a normal election. This is not a normal candidate. This is not a normal former president. This is not a normal 
human being, in my opinion, um, that it, that is deserving of the amount of uh, support and attention and power he has. But that's where it's really important that the media doesn't just decide to advance this idea of two polar camps in this country um, of almost equivalent support and actually help inform the folks that are following Trump blindly or just you know, being uh, saturated with lies and disinformation because of the media channels they choose to follow. Um, you know, they don't, you know, the vast majority of Americans recent polling shows would not support someone convicted of these crimes that he has been charged with. So I also hope that, you know, there are convictions um, and that folks are aware of those and they're aware of the charges that, um, you know, he has to pay hundreds of millions of dollars uh, for cases that he has already lost. I think that will make a difference if that information actually reaches the majority of voters. I think the great threat and challenge is that it won't in the current decentralized ecosystem we're in. And for the ones who, who claim to be the trusted messengers in the, you know, uh, in NBC News and CNN and the New York Times and the Washington Post, um, they have a lot of work to do and they have to change how they're doing it. And they also have to make that uh, reporting more accessible to more people. And they should do that because it's it's not only good for democracy and informing the public and achieving their mission, it's also going to be good for their business if they figure out how to be accessible and relatable uh, and relevant to more people. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, if you do the right thing, it can be very profitable. You know, I think that with, with the Green New Deal that no one talks about, it's like, do you understand, like, Putting the nation to work building wind turbines and converting stuff to solar and everything, it's so potentially profitable. And, and, and really, everybody's going to feel good about it. And, and yet, you know, to be stuck in your ways about either energy, you know, drilling for oil or the way that you produce news content, it, it, it's, it's very antiquated and it, and it lacks that kind of, it's not even progressive thinking. It's just modern. Just be modern about how you, strategize both in in politics and in 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 news um we have to take a quick pause for our sponsor but i, I want to come back and, and actually want to ask you something about stormy daniels which i i discovered when i watched her documentary a couple of days ago uh, back with tara mcgowan next 10 seconds on the clock how many things can you name that are always growing your relationships your skills your customer base how about businesses on Shopify? When we started podcasting, an online store was the furthest thing from our minds. Now we're selling t-shirts and Midas Touch merch, and it's so easy, all because we use Shopify. <coughs> Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business, from the launch of your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the, did we just hit a million orders stage? Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're delivering daily digests or serving sensational scoops, Shopify will help you sell everywhere. From their all-in-one e-commerce platform to their in-person point-of-sale system, wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Shopify helps you turn browsers into buyers with the internet's best converting checkout, up to 36% better compared to other leading commerce platforms. And sell more with less effort thanks to Shopify Magic, your AI-powered all-star. Shopify powers 10% of all e-commerce in the US. And Shopify is the global force behind Allbirds and Rothneys and Brooklinen and millions of other entrepreneurs of every size across 175 countries. Plus, Shopify's extensive help resources are there to support your success at every step of the way, because businesses that grow, grow with Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash weekend. Go to shopify.com slash weekend now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. That's shopify.com slash weekend. We're back with Tara McGowan uh, from Korean Newsroom. I'm Anthony Davis from 5-Minute News. And so... I watched this Stormy Tan Daniels documentary the other day. I, I highly recommend that everybody watches it. I didn't know much about her. You said something earlier that was very interesting. You said that, you know, he, he paid this hush money because he had sexual relations with the porn star Stormy Daniels. Watching the documentary, I learned that he didn't have sexual relations with her. She didn't want to have sex with him. He 
forced himself upon her, but she didn't report it as a, as a rape. She just went along with it because, you know, that was where she was at in her head at the time. She's also a registered Republican. <laughs> Not that that affects this particular moment, but you know, people don't really understand what was at stake here. And and this is the other thing that I find very interesting is that had that story have been a story about a crime, it would have changed the whole narrative. And watching the documentary made it absolutely clear to me that there are women who, are, you know, whether you work in the porn industry or not, who are still, you know, feel because of this, the hierarchy and the patriarchy and everything that goes with it, that they, they, they've they reprogrammed themselves not to think of these incidents as crimes. I have not seen the documentary yet, so actually I, I wasn't aware of that and I'm going to watch it. Um, I think, though, to your larger point, I mean, something that a really terrible uh, thought um, when you were saying this, though, that crossed my mind that I want to share is that I don't know that it would have mattered. Um, I would like to think that it would. That is the world I would like to live in. Um, I don't know fully that we're in that world yet. Um, you know, I, I don't think that uh, E. Jean Carroll's, um, uh, you know, her own testimonial of him raping her, which that has been validated now. And um, the court has agreed that he assaulted her and then also owed her an enormous sum of money because of defaming her. Um, uh, after she came forward, when repeatedly she repeatedly defaming her, so repeatedly, she could sue him again now. Yeah, repeatedly, exactly. And you know what? What a hero to take one for the team because it is incredibly brave um, to be a woman who has been sexually assaulted, especially by somebody prominent and someone who has been president or running for president, um, and to make that probably the largest known part of your identity for the rest of your life. Um, in order to seek justice and to ensure that it doesn't happen again or that person uh, pays for those crimes. That is not an easy thing to do. As a woman who has been sexually assaulted, I am like most women in the world. Um, it is, it's an incredibly difficult uh, thing to do. It's an incredibly brave thing to do. And it's an incredibly, uh, in, in these women's uh, positions, incredibly patriotic thing to do. Um, to be able to come forward about that. So I, I think that's a horrible part of the story that I and most people are not necessarily aware of. Um, Isn't it interesting that the media haven't picked up on it, that the media must have watched the documentary as I did and, and heard her saying that she thought he was disgusting, that she, had, she, did not, she wasn't attracted to him. He shows up in the room, walks out of the bathroom wearing you know, nothing but a, his underpants or a robe, I forget, and, and literally like forces her on the bed. And, and, and yet the media have not run a single story about the fact that this is different, that it's, it's, it changes the narrative. That's what surprised me the most. Oh, Anthony, this is a bigger conversation about <laughs> patriarchy and bias in right, media right, but, and trusting right. women. Um, right. I'm, I'm, I'm even thinking of how to be careful and how I respond to this uh, without too much of an emotional reaction, because I, you know, I am certain that there is probably a lot of bias about uh, among media executives of whether they can uh, they can position her as a trusted messenger um, right. or right of someone uh, that they want to um, lift up uh, her story because of her background and because of her choices. Um, we don't have a great deal of respect for uh, sex work or sex workers in this country or in other countries. Um, so you know, I'm I I'm, I don't want to make assumptions, but you know, I do live in this world. I am pretty clear eyed about it, and I'm. I'm sure that's part of it. And as to my earlier point, um, it's a brave thing because you are you are no, undoubtedly going to be disparaged, disparaged and defamed and disgraced um, if you're a woman who comes forward about having been uh, assaulted by a man, whether he was powerful or not. Um, it's just part of uh, it's just it's just part of uh, the world that we live in still, unfortunately. So I think it's really brave of her to come forward. I, I wish that it would be a bigger story um, that the media would talk about more. Um, you know, we also 
I, I will never, ever forget the day in my office at, when I was working at Priorities USA, the major super PAC running um, a campaign against Donald Trump the first time he ran for president in 2016. I will never forget the day that the Access Hollywood video dropped and we all, our jaws dropped to the floor as we watched it. And, you know, there was a, a part of all of us on the team in that room that was like, this, this, this could kill him. This could be it. And it didn't, as we all know. It didn't, didn't change happen. anything. If anything, and, it made him more popular. And the the unbelievable sorrow is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. Um, that I know I and millions and millions of women felt in understanding that that didn't matter, that that was not disqualifying. Um, and that was before we knew uh, that, you know, he would be an accused uh, rapist. Um, it is, it's, it's it's a very difficult topic for me to talk about because um, there was a time uh, where I was very naive and believed that that would be disqualifying for a man to run and be president of this country. And unfortunately, uh, we know now that it isn't. I, I feel, I mean, like you, I feel all sorts of things. You know, I have a daughter. I think about these th things a lot. And I recognize that the fact that Stormy Daniels, because she's a porn star, there will be a percentage of, of people who think, well, it's not possible for her to be raped by nature of her chosen profession. And that in itself is, is, a, is, a, is a stain on, on humanity in the US, that that position can be taken. And my fear is that that position is taken by, by lawmakers invariably old white men. A lot of this goes back to that, doesn't it? It sure does. And there's also um, antiquated laws, I believe, still on the books in some states. I don't think that they're um, enforced, thankfully, uh, but I do believe that they are still in some state constitutions that, uh, that, that essentially say that um, a wife can't be raped by her husband. Yes. So... Um, this is, I mean, deeply entrenched in culture and society. This is what, you know, us uh, feminist liberals are uh, talking about when we're talking about the patriarchy. Um, unfortunately, is that um, uh, the diminishing of women um, and the not believing or trusting them uh, is uh, it, it, it's at every level. And so, yeah, to be um, a proud and successful porn star, um, you're you're starting at a disadvantage to be trusted um, if you are, if you're raped or assaulted or believed or respected. Um, and I think that is a stain. Uh, and I, I think also that, you know, again, this is a whole different podcast and a different rabbit hole, but, uh, the taboos around sex and the relationship between religious communities and how it's talked about and, and, uh, and, and gender dynamics and kind of, you know, uh, nuclear family dynamics. There's all of these issues. Uh, and, you know, I think that's part of why there is a war, um, a culture war at, at the really of the highest frequency I've ever felt or experienced just in terms of what the far right and the Christian ideology and Christian nationalism that infuses so much of their agenda is trying to truly bring us back to a time of fully oppressing women. Right. Um, there is, you know, a, a, a viral trend uh, that has been uh, propagated by the by the far right called trad wives, traditional wives. Yeah. Right. All about, you know, glamorizing being a housewife and just living to please your husband and be a stay at home mom. And I don't disparage stay at home moms. I think that's got to be the hardest job in the world. It's why I don't have it. Um, and I uh, I I just it is. Um, it really is a, a true fight in this election, is a true fight about, um, you know, how, how we do respect women. Uh, do we respect women? Do we respect them to make their own choices um, about their bodies and when and how and if they want to have children? Um, do we want them to be able to um, continue to contribute massively to this economy as they have done, as they have become a much larger part of the workforce? Or do we want to put them back in the house um, so men can maintain power? And I think it all comes out of um, a real desperation and fear and insecurity of men, of weak men. Um, who are scared of losing control and power um, because uh, uh, if women have it. And, you know, that's a bigger conversation, but that is truly what is at stake. 
that is what Trump and the right represents is is trying to take us back and and put women in a position where they don't have a voice at the table, where they don't have a seat at the table. And we've been there before and generations and generations of women and women and good men fought um, for for equality and equity. And we're not still not fully there, but they would they would like to take us right back. And I think this is just another another symptom of that. The, the Christian nationalism, which is embedded in this Project 2025, as you say, which the Heritage Foundation published, there's around 40 advocacy groups also on the far right that are, have put their name, literally put their names to this. I mean, there is a whole list of contributors in, in the back. But Mike Johnson is now the Speaker of the House, second in line to the presidency, also a far right Christian nationalist. And you know, he has been very outspoken about his views and how he views everything through the lens of the of the Bible. But there there is so much hypocrisy because often a lot of these Christian nationalist views, which seem very hardline, anti-women, anti-minority groups and everything that goes with that, the hypocrisy comes that when you do some investigation, that actually a lot of these men are cheating on their wives. A lot of these men are behaving in the completely opposite way to you know the, uh, the way that a, a good christian would be expected to be ha- to behave and we hear about it in in news stories i mean stories break all the time about about these religious sects or these uh you know religious cults nexium for example and you know how how do we how do we kind of qualify this when they're saying one thing but behind the scenes doing something else the hypocrisy, um, yeah. right? Do as I say, not as I do. Um, the thing is, uh, most people really don't like hypocrites. Um, they don't like uh, corruption. They, you know, there is historic, uh, really unprecedented mistrust right now in government and politics and politicians and in media among Americans and and in other countries around the world. And it that it is because of that hypocrisy, right? It is because of this longstanding tradition of politicians um, projecting certain values uh, and positions and then living very differently, right? Like this is what will get me elected among factions um, of the population that I need. Uh, so I will represent what they believe and what they want to right. hear. But I won't actually practice it in my own like life. Like Trump selling Bibles now it's, when he's exactly, never read the thing. Trump selling Bibles, right? Or, you know, a, a, a Republican that is for their entire lives voted against um, uh, abortion rights or access and then, you know, pays off uh, a woman to get an abortion um, we slept with, right? Like we've heard these stories before. When they do come to light, though, they are... Um, they are very, very uh, uh, effective at, um, at at bringing some of these folks down because folks don't want hypocrisy because it leads to mistrust. And so I, I think that that hypocrisy needs to be talked about more. It needs to be proven out more and shown. Um, you know, I think like we're seeing this with the Supreme Court scandals, right? Like the Supreme Court is supposed to be one of the most revered um, bodies of our government, right? And and, and they are not supposed to be um, at all partisan or political. This is just about upholding the Constitution and and you know and interpreting it for modern times and modern society in order for all of us to to you know be able to live prosperous lives. And yet we have Supreme Court justices still on the court who refuse to recuse themselves, by the way, from another of cases that they have conflicts with directly, who are taking bribes, who are taking money, who are taking vacations, who are taking all sorts of lavish gifts and lifestyle um, subsidizing by billionaires who are, who are, the, who are they, they are then literally doing their bidding in their, um, in their decisions in the courts. This is this is horrific when you step back and you look at it and you see like that, you know, that this is um, insidious in our institutions. And if we don't call it out and if we don't hold these people accountable and we don't take folks off the courts for ethics um, violations like Clarence Thomas and many, I mean, his wife was one of the organizers of the insurrection. Like it's just, it's, it's, it's really just unfathomable in some ways. If we don't, take action against this and we don't um we don't hold these people accountable then 
we do lose the, the core, right? We do lose the center. We do lose the ability um, to have these institutions to protect us and our rights. And so that is the fight that we're in right now. Um, the reason we have an extremist and corrupt Supreme Court that is responsible for over, overturning Roe v. Wade and, you know, have really big cases about, you know, how we make decisions about our body and our lives um, in front of them right now, this week, even uh, three of those um, Supreme Court justices were put on that court by Donald Trump. Whoever's the next president, whoever wins the presidential election in November of this year could choose up to two more replacements of justices on the Supreme Court. If you don't vote for any other reason in the world, vote because the Supreme Court will be made up or remade um, in the design of the next president. And that is where this Supreme Court is ensuring that all of our rights are moved to the states um, uh, and away from federal government. And, you know, it, that is, uh, and they have also done Trump's bidding directly. Sorry to go on a tangent about them, but, you know, they originally denied the ability to hear the case about Trump's immunity and then they changed their minds. Why yeah. did they change their minds? That was a gift to his campaign. To well, delay. it's payback, isn't it? I mean, you know, he gifted three of them a lifelong appointment and in return, he expects something. That's how a mafia boss operates. Yes. And they they have shown us that they are fully prepared to hand this election to him if the decision about uh, who wins that election, if it comes too close to call in more than one state in this country, will go to the Supreme Court. I personally have zero faith or confidence that they will do the right and just thing in that situation. Well, they're politicians, aren't they? I mean, the idea for me anyway, coming from England, where we don't have political appoint, appointed judges, it, you know, to the point that I've made to all Americans when I talk about this is, is how is it even possible that your, that your high court judges are, are, are political? It, well, it, and that's that's a good distinction, right? They're not politicians because still, at least today, still in America, politicians have to be elected. Justices are not. <laughs> they are appointed. And in, you know, some of the some of Trump's justices that he appointed case, they were rammed through pretty unceremoniously yeah. um, in ways that, uh, you know, under Mitch McConnell's leadership in the Senate was was not made possible under President Obama's administration when there were open seats. So um, yeah. there's just. um they are political, though, for sure. They have an agenda. They have an ideological agenda. They have a Christian national agenda, and they are imposing it in their decisions. The uh, former Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer said uh, in his new book that conservative justices' approach can't serve the country and is doomed to fail. Um, in the book, he hits hard at the approach of his conservative former colleagues and sounds a public alarm. He says if the court continues to deploy their methods of interpretation... We will have a constitution that no one wants. It's a, a remarkable statement from a former Supreme Court justice, wouldn't you say? Yeah, it, it sends chills down my body because we're, we're living through that reality now um, as it comes to fruition. So I think that this is, uh, you know, it's the most effective thing Trump did for the folks that got him into yeah. the White House uh, was, was, was hand the Supreme Court over. Um, to right-wing extremists and federalist society uh, yeah. uh, um, folks. And so it's, uh, it's you know, it has to also be made clear to the American people, especially the ones that are not as politically engaged or don't consume as much traditional media, that um, the decisions made by that court are not the decisions made by this administration, but by a Supreme Court that the majority was built by Donald Trump and he will uh, only expand um, the extremists on that court if he is reelected. And that is where most of our decisions will be made about our lives. You know, you know, that feeling you get when you're like, oh, it's going to be fine. They'll do the right thing. You know, I'm sure you felt that way when you thought Hillary Clinton was going to win in 2016. The people will do the right thing. And it, it didn't work out like that. But I, I get this feeling with the court, especially regarding his immunity case. People are saying, oh, no, you know, they'll. And I'm like, no. They won't. Only because I learnt my lesson over Brexit. You know, I believe that, that the Brits wouldn't vote to leave Europe, and they did. And so I'm, I'm not 
taking anything for granted anymore. And so I'm saying, and I'm one of very few in, in this medium that is saying that they will absolutely grant him immunity because it ties up with what his lawyer was saying only on, on Friday. He was arguing for the Georgia uh, election interference indictment to be dismissed on free speech grounds. This is Stephen Sado, Trump's attorney. He argued for tossing out the Georgia election interference case on First Amendment grounds at, at a pre-trial hearing. He said, the reason why we don't even get to trial is because it's unconstitutional to force an accused to stand trial on, on protected speech. I mean, these things are, are all connected in, in my mind. They are. I was, I was going to say when you said uh, uh, when you brought up Hillary Clinton's election, I I was always a pecu peculiar case. And it's because I think I started my career in journalism before I went to politics and came back to journalism. I never, ever, ever believed that they were going to do the right thing. Interesting. Um, I, I was really, really personally um, impacted and affected by uh, the mushroom cloud lies and disinformation that put us in a war that we should never have gotten into after 9-11. Um, they, you know, uh, it, it, the the extreme right in this country has lied their way into wars and into power um, and into the ability to, to take back um, so many of the rights that we fought so hard for. Um, I was always vehemently um, furious and frustrated at my colleagues who, who did say that Mitch McConnell would do the right thing or wouldn't hold himself to a different standard uh, or, um, you know, than he was holding Democrats to. And that has um, been proven to not be the case every single time. We have to take them at their word. We have to take them at their word because they mean what they say and they do what they say. And uh, we can't be blinded um, by our own hope, right? Our own hope and belief in humanity and people and that people will do right because there are some people who are truly, truly operating um, purely for their own power and greed um, and an ideology that is incredibly, incredibly harmful uh, to the ability for us to have a truly diverse representative um, democracy and, and country in America. So we have to be very clear eyed and vigilant about it. And we have to find the joy in the work and in the privilege in, in being here in this moment to do this work because it is going to be hard and grueling. Um, but they will take everything away. And they are they are being very explicit about that if they have the chance. The, the extremism that they represent, though, has been ramping up and up and up since 2016. So if you give people the benefit of the doubt in 2016, they maybe just saw Trump as the guy from The Apprentice, but they hadn't really gone deeper than that. But now there is so much evidence of his position and his ownership of Roe being overturned and his position on immigrants and migrants and black and brown people. It's so, there's so much clarity with that. And you know, this hate speech also towards the judiciary, I don't think does him any favors either. So would you change your position on, on giving people the benefit of the doubt this time around? I mean, are people now not a little more educated? Do they not really now know what they are voting for or against? I think people know. I think the biggest threat is actually people being so tired and frustrated that yeah. they don't get engaged and that they don't turn out for whatever reason. Maybe, um, you know, they haven't been super excited about the Biden administration or they haven't felt the positive impacts yet of all of the accomplishments and the legislation that's been passed because it takes time. Um, uh, or, you know, they just don't like the two candidates and they're not inspired by either of them um, or, you know, they're just not paying attention or they're fatigued or they're tuning out because it is a lot and it is uh, it is depressing to think and hear about Donald Trump for this many years of our lives. Um, that's the biggest threat to our democracy is the folks who who do tune out, who don't see that they still have a role and responsibility or they take it for granted. They think that, you know, Biden's a shoe in because how could anybody show up and vote for Trump after everything that we know? Um, but the truth of the matter is millions and millions of people will. Uh, and, you know, we have big business in this country that is cheerleading for Trump to win uh, because they don't want regulation. 
Um, and so, you know, this is also where it used to be kind of quaint and cute. It, well, now it feels quaint and cute. It wasn't certainly at the time, but where democracy didn't really feel that real when we had Republicans in the Senate and Congress, um, you know, voting against what 70 or 80 percent of Americans supported when it came to things like gun control um, or, or action on climate change. And it was because they are getting paid off, right, by the gun lobby, et cetera, right? Like they were there to represent whoever filled their campaign coffers and not their constituents. And now it's at the point where I think oftentimes they just think the courts that they have that they have taken control over will just do their bidding for them. They don't want a democracy, right? We have to be really clear and explicit about that. They do not want a democratic government. They do not want the people to choose who is in power and represents them and for those people to truly represent what they want. They want authoritarian control. They want command and control. They want to make decisions that benefit them and their friends and their peers. And they want to take this country back to a place that it was never founded on <laughs> the principles of. Um, they want a Christian state. They want uh, these things that marginalize um, massive, massive, massive uh, populations in this country that they don't see as equal or equivalent um, to them. And so um, this is a long game that they have been playing. Uh, and, and, you know, the silver lining is that since it has come above the surface with Donald Trump and, um, and the shock of his win for so many in 2016, uh, Democrats and pro-democracy Americans have showed up and won nearly every election that we have had since. And I do believe that that will happen again, but it is going to take everybody understanding that the stakes are even higher and not lower because we've seen this show before, because um, it will not be the same. Uh, it was horrible when Trump was president. A lot of people were hurt. A lot of lives were lost. Yeah, pe people forget, don't they? People forget. I just go back to where we were four years ago. Trump asked that question, weren't you better off? <laughs> no, right. we yeah. were in lockdown. We had no light at the end of the tunnel of the pandemic. We had no idea when that was going to end or if our lives were ever going to go back to normal again. Four years later, it's almost easy to forget it happened. I mean, not for a lot of people, but like, you know, our lives are more or less Back to normal. Yeah. Um, President Biden um, I put the pandemic to an end with mass vaccine deployment and putting money in people's pockets um, and saving small businesses across this country. So um, it will be worse than it was in Trump 1.0 if he is reelected because one, he stated as much. He yeah. learned a little bit along the way. He learned what he could get away with more. He has incredibly strong allies in our biggest foes in Putin, in Russia and in China. Um, and so it's just, I don't think anybody can really, really can understand or conceptualize what this country will look like under a second Trump administration um, or the fact that it's not hyperbolic at all that we may not have a democratic election for president yeah. after 2024 um, if he makes his way into the White House. I want to talk about the spanner in the works to a, a Joe Biden victory, and that could be the Electoral College. We, we have to take another quick break, but we'll be back in just a moment with Tara McGowan. I've always found it difficult to find clothes that I like to wear. And when I find one thing that works, I just buy loads of them and just wear the same thing all the time. Well, men's closets were due for a radical reinvention. And Roan stepped up to the challenge. Roan's commuter collection is the most comfortable, breathable and flexible set of products known to man. And here's why. Roan helps you get ready for any occasion. The commuter collection offers the world's most comfortable pants, dress shirts, zips and polos. You'll never have to worry about what to wear when you've got the Roan commuter collection. The comfortable four-way stretch fabric provides breathability and flexibility that leaves you free to enjoy what life throws your way from your commute to work or your 18 holes of golf. It's time to feel confident without the hassle. With Roan's wrinkle release technology, wrinkles disappear as you stretch and wear the products. It's that easy. And with Gold Fusion anti-odor technology, you'll be smelling fresh and clean all day long. And on top of that, Roan is 100% machine washable, so you can ditch the dry cleaner altogether. I personally love a technical fabric, something that is advanced and uses technology to make a more comfortable and more modern outfit. 
Now the commuter collection can get you through any workday and straight into whatever comes next. So head to roan.com slash Anthony and use promo code Anthony to save 20% off your entire order. That's 20% off your entire order when you head to rhone.com slash Anthony and use code Anthony, A-N-T-H-O-N-Y. It's time to find your corner office comfort. We're back on the weekend show. A federal court will allow South Carolina Republicans to use their congressional map for the 2024 election. It said on Thursday, despite a, an earlier finding that the same plan discriminates against black voters. The decision is a big win for Republicans who are aided by the U.S. Supreme Court's slow action on the case. Th- this is an example of how the Electoral College is used as a, as a strategic device to shoo in Republicans, to stifle the vote, to prevent black people from voting in in certain districts. We've heard it before, and with the Supreme Court in place, it doesn't seem like it. You know that that system has been overridden in, in any way. H- how do you feel about the the complexities of the Electoral College and 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 how it is stacked towards Republicans winning? How do I feel about it? Um, I feel so many things about it. Um, I, I, the fact that we have an electoral college in this country means that we don't have a true democracy, right? That is the thing that is imperfect that we want to make more perfect over time or improve upon. Um, right now, we have to be distracted by the fact that we just have to keep one before we can really build on it and improve upon it. But they are uh, continuing to whittle away at the rights and freedoms of Americans to participate in a democracy and be represented by one. Um, with decisions like this, uh, you know, um, I I think a lot and talk a lot about apathy and the danger of apathy among Americans right now. But I think it's really important that um, that folks with a platform, and especially Democrats, um, address something that that people feel that is real, which is that they aren't and haven't for the most part, been truly represented um, in in the current system that we have. And what I mean by that is that a lot of people don't feel like their vote matters. And I believe every single vote matters, and it does, and it especially matters um, no matter where you live, when you, in your local elections and your state elections that are becoming even more important than ever before as our, our decisions about our rights get moved to state houses. Um, but I will say, if you don't live in electoral college state that is a battleground or truly competitive when it comes to just the presidential election, um, it is hard to believe that your vote really matters. You have to believe just in your agency as a citizen and the role you play as a part of something so much bigger than yourself. But it is true that, you know, I live in Rhode Island. Um, It is a very blue state. I'm so proud of it. I'm proud that we are raising the ceiling on so many things like protecting women's access to abortion and LGBTQ plus rights, like it, it's, we're, we're raising the ceiling across the board, but does my vote in the presidential election uh, as, a, as a resident of Rhode Island matter as much as my friend who lives in Madison, Wisconsin? Absolutely not. Uh, it, that's just the fact of the matter. And so, you know, that's, that's a, a little bit of a demobilizing message. It's why you don't hear it so often, but people already know it. And so I also think it's important to acknowledge that, that your vote matters a lot more in the presidential election if you do live in a state like Arizona or Nevada or Wisconsin or Michigan or Pennsylvania than it might in a, in a deep in a deep blue state. If you are a Democrat or just a pro-democracy human who lives in a deep red state, uh, your vote really matters too because uh, uh, there just has to be more of you and you create a permission structure for other people. And we also know that There are people in states like Kansas uh, and Indiana who absolutely share values when it comes to supporting um, abortion and reproductive access. We saw that with the ballot initiative in Kansas that had overwhelming, overwhelming support to protect abortion access. So um, I think that uh, we if 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 it were up to me, we would rid ourselves of the Electoral College in this country Um, if if presidential uh, elections were decided by the popular vote. A Republican would not have won the presidential election um, in the greater part of my lifetime. Uh, that's a that's a fact of the matter. Uh, it would have been a blowout, <laughs> the past yeah. number of elections for Democrats. It was just one time, wasn't it? I think George, George W. Bush was like the one 
hold out on the popular vote. That's what I was I was thinking in my head when I said the better perks. I was like, was it his father? Yes, yeah. exactly. Um, so it, it's yeah, it's a it's it, it's an imperfect system that's becoming more imperfect under these current courts. Uh, and that's not even to talk about gerrymandering, right, which is another way in which they are uh, um Twisting the knife on our democracy and uh, and and taking democracy, quote unquote, and and turning it into a map of just a way for them to win when they have power and control over the drawing of those maps. So really, the message going into this election is that, you know, don't stay home. Right. It's your 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 level of engagement almost has to go beyond your own vote. You need to make sure that your friends are voting and your neighbors are voting and to really encourage this uh, involvement at a, at a level that's never been seen before. Because, you know, a lot of people are saying that this is the most important election in history. The stakes have never been higher. It's true. And it's not just um, the most important to all of us who will live through the, whoever, um, you know, is in charge of this country and their administration. It's also it's it, you mentioned this earlier about European nations and leaders. This is going to have massive consequences on our entire world. Yeah. Um, massive consequences. And so uh, we are at a moment that feels like I have shivers on my body right now, but um, it, it's an incredibly volatile moment um, in the world. And, uh, you know, America still is that beacon of hope. America still is the greatest leader um, when it comes to freedom and democracy and being able to uphold that and fight for that in countries abroad. Like, you know, what we're doing to support Ukraine, what we're not doing because of Trump and Republicans holding Ukraine aid, aid hostage in the House of Representatives after it passed the Senate. These are these are incredible incredibly consequential events and and decisions. And so uh, it, it is not just about voting is the minimum, right? That's the bare yeah. minimum we can all do. Everybody has to vote. Make sure you're registered to vote. Absolutely vote. Get your friends and neighbors to vote. But also, if you don't live in one of the six or seven battleground electoral college states, um, go through your phone's contact list and think about who does. And reach out to them and ask them what they're doing or what you can do to help or donate to the candidates um, that are running um, in the Senate and House and down ballot races in those states. Get them more resources. If you live adjacent to one of those states, get in your car and go knock on doors or volunteer um, on a weekend or um, bring your kids or your friends to do the same. I mean, do everything right? Do everything that you can. Lean into your strengths and your capacities and your resources and do every single thing that you can to make sure that when we wake up the day after the election, if the election's been decided or the day after the outcome has been decided, because it's no longer so simple uh, as the day of sometimes, um, that you really think that no matter what the outcome is, you didn't leave anything on the table. Because I am sure every single person remembers where they were and how they felt when they learned that Donald Trump was elected president of this country. And we cannot afford to have that again. And the world cannot afford for us to mess this up. There is a, a little a beacon of hope. And I, I want to mention the Democratic candidate Marilyn Lands, who campaigned on ending Alabama's near total abortion ban and protecting access to contraception and IVF. She won a special election on Tuesday for a Huntsville area state house seat, uh, succeeding the former Republican David uh, Cole, uh, who resigned in August after pleading guilty to voter fraud charges. Um, she said, Marilyn Land said that Alabama women and families sent a clear message that will be heard in Montgomery and across the nation. This is the thing that I, I've been thinking about a lot, that, you know, women, there are slightly more women than men who vote, statistically. And there's also a lot of young men who want to be able to have recreational sex and not start a family. And I think we forget about those people as well. The importance of the, the, a woman's right to choose going into this election, really, you know, this is the first election of its kind since Roe was overturned and since we really know the position of Republicans going forward, especially now as they're coming after contraception and, and, and goodness knows what else. I mean, I, I do have faith in, in, in women 
and the men who support them. Would you not say that that is actually something to really kind of pin our hopes on? Because that's where I'm at right now. Yeah, women are angry. (laughs) And anger can be really powerful. I'm angry. I try to channel that anger. Um, Anger can be a really powerful force. It doesn't have to be uh, a negative thing. Uh, It's important. And it's important to, to put it to work. And I, you know, I am so, so, I was so excited to hear the results. I was not surprised. I was excited. Um, uh, and proud that uh, that she won in Alabama in a state that's at the front lines of the IVF debate, right? Where yes. their Supreme Court in Alabama um, uh, essentially has made that uh, a, a more difficult. Um, and uh, and you know, there's been a lot of debate in insider political circles about like. You know, I mentioned the the ballot initiative in Kansas and the overwhelming turnout to sub, to uh, protect abortion rights in in a very red state like that, where people are like, "Well, um, that's if it's on the ballot, but not on a candidate, will it translate to the candidates?" And absolutely, yes, it will. There was also a special election in I think the Florida House that was a huge DeSantis, overwhelming DeSantis district that just went to a Democrat in a special election yeah. um, over similar reasons. So I have enormous faith um, uh, in the American people and in women in particular at being able to carry us uh, across um, the finish line. And we need more of them running for office. We need more of them in office and in positions of power and in boardrooms and in CEO seats uh, because I, you know, I am biased, but I do very much believe that men have had a shot at running everything for a very long time and, and having the majority majority of the seats in Congress uh, and and, you know, have been the only gender as president of this country to date. And I don't think that they have done such a great job all the time. Um, and I think, you know, it is it is worth trying out uh, a different path forward and seeing how that goes. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, every time a woman wins, it inspires another woman to run. And uh, and that's also an, a really incredible outcome. So I, I hope that that is I hope that this election once again brings more women into the process where they're not just participating and bailing us out from extremist candidates or uh, or situations and events, but that they are actually running and and winning and, and taking over um, in a lot of ways to see if they can uh, put us on a different path. I was thinking as you were talking about uh, women are angry, I was thinking about um uh, Representative Jasmine Crockett in the uh, in in this that sham impeachment of Joe Biden, where she was just like giving it to to the other side in in such a way, and I was like, you know, we need more women, but we also need people of color, and we need to hear the anger. We don't really need to temper the the anger. It doesn't have to be violent. Doesn't have to resort to physical violence, but language is very powerful. And that's what I really felt with with Jasmine Crockett is her use of language was beautiful. And really, there, you know, so especially since the Trumpism, you know, the use of language in debate has really been diluted so much. You know, terrible, terribly simple language and and use of you know the wrong words <laughs> in the wrong places, and and to and to actually hear some proper debate with passion. And an extensive vocabulary. I was just so thrilled. That is such a huge part of the job of being a leader. Right, right. Being a representative is you are there to represent your people, represent their anger, represent their um, sadness, their joy, their, right? And so we need right now more than ever, we need leaders who are showing us they have the fight in them. Because this is the fight of our lives for our democracy, and they are the ones that have the platforms, right? And the bully pulpits and the megaphones, and so like it's why I was also just so, uh, you know, I was beside myself watching the State of the Union because President Biden showed us that he has the fight in him, yeah. and and can also do it in his wonderful way of calling out Republicans and making everybody laugh while really he's you know undressing them and shaming yeah. them for the things that. It's very hard to do that, for. isn't it? I think people Very really hard. underestimate how difficult so. it is to to have a, a kind of dual narrative, to be able to inject humor. It requires you to be very sharp. It's not something Donald Trump is is capable of. In fact, if, if anything, the only time he ever got a laugh was at, at the United Nations when he made a speech and said that, that 
you know, he was the greatest president in history and he'd done more for America and the world than anyone. And everyone just started laughing at him. And he goes, well, I wasn't expecting that. I mean, two completely different candidates. Yeah. I mean, how often do you meet a bully that you actually think is very smart? They yeah. tend to be a bully and resort to bullying because they don't have better strategies um, to get what they want. So I think that's, you know, I think that's part of it. And I think uh, to your earlier point, I just think everybody has to actually uh, use what they feel in this election and express it and give permission for other people uh, to feel it and to express it because um, we cannot afford to sugarcoat anything right now. We have to be really clear eyed and we have to give people hope, right? Show them how all of us together can actually um, get out of this mess and put ourselves back on a good track and focus on the things that actually matter and solving problems rather than staving off the absolute worst <laughs> that yes. they would bring to the table. But um, I, I think that's so important. That's how I, it's a huge measure of leadership when I look at people is, you know, are, are you really going to be able to, uh, you know, speak on behalf of people and really channel what they're going through and provide them that catharsis and provide them that representation and, and get things done. So uh, yeah, Jasmine, I'm a huge, huge fan. And we have a lot of great folks like that. I just think um, this is not normal times. We cannot be uh, normal or, you know, uh, uh, censored, I think, too much in our communications. I think that, that would be to our detriment. Agreed. Okay, we have to finish. But Tara McGowan, thank you. I'm so proud of you and, and the work that you do. Seriously. Back at you, Anthony. Thank you so much. This was a pleasure. I'm Anthony Davis. Don't forget to support me and independent journalism at patreon.com slash five minute news. Download the five minute news podcast, catch our YouTube channel and join me next week with a brand new special guest and more factual news to discuss on the five minute news weekend show with Midas Touch.